Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Stigma and Discrimination Based on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity in the Commonwealth Caribbean. We have a panel discussion, which will be preceded by a presentation. We begin now, and we want to welcome also uh, persons who are joining us via the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights portal uh, on the World Wide, World Wide Web. As we begin tonight's program, I want to invite the Deputy Dean, Faculty of Law, to make some introductory remarks. Mr. Jeff Kamabach, Deputy Dean, Faculty of Law. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the head table, keynote speaker, moderator, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the subject matter of tonight's discussion is a topic that begs for public interrogation at an intellectual rather than the emotive level as it has so often been discussed. It can scarcely be denied that the regional attitude to lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transsexuals and intersex persons, especially the first two categories, is typically discriminatory not necessarily against the individuals themselves, of course, but against their sexual orientation, although it is readily conceded that the distinction is not always made. This stance is owed, in my view, to an amalgam of the current legislation which criminalizes non-heterosexual conduct, justification by reference to biblical injunction, an ignorant ascription of the etiology of HIV AIDS and the fact of difference coupled with an unnatural and seemingly besotted preoccupation with the sexual lives of others. In such a context, anyone contending for the human rights of LGBTI persons to be respected will find him or herself up against a veritable wall of populist opposition. Sexual orientation is not a human right, some will argue. Others will posit the slippery slope argument. If we legalize sexual orientations, will this also include bestiality and incest? Nor is any comfort likely to be found in officialdom. An administration dependent on popular support for its continued tenure is most unlikely to dare to be a Daniel and to buck the apparently majoritarian view. Indeed, they are rather, rather prone to endorsing it in order to appear politically compliant. I have already encountered such a circumstance at 2010 meeting of the Legal Affairs Committee of CARICOM comprising the Attorney Generals of me Attorneys General of Member States, where I made a presentation on behalf of PAHO advocating a reform of the current laws against buggery. The immediate reaction of that learned audience was essentially negative. As it is with the popular discussion, there were references to the Bible, to our quote-unquote way of life, the ongoing economic crisis, and is, as is normal for lawyers killed in the ancient forms of action, an evasive suggestion that we had advanced, advanced our case to the wrong body, since this was really a health matter. Tonight we shall again address with our distinguished keynote speaker and panel some of these issues in the context of those human rights to which we have committed our polity. I trust that the discussion will be both informative and provocative and that issue will be courageously joined by the audience on the sordid aspects of stigmatization and discrimination, subjects that should occupy a central role in the history of the peoples of these islands. Thank you very much, and I turn you over to the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Jeff Kamabach, for the introductory remarks, which have made it clear that the task before us is indeed uh, a major one. The afternoon's proceedings will, will go as follows. Uh, we will shortly have a keynote address, which will be followed by presentations from representatives of the LGBT associations in Trinidad and Tobago and also from Barbados. 
And thereafter, the floor is open for interaction with yourself. And uh, this is an interaction which I will be the, the moderator of, which is a role I seem to have become familiar with of late. So at this time, I, I want to introduce to you the keynote address, uh, the person who will be making for you the keynote address. She, is, uh, she does have dual citizenship of both St. Lucia and Trinidad and Tobago. Having been elected at the 41st OAS General Assembly in June 2001 for a four-year term, and this started on January 1, 2012. In her day job, because she reminds me that this is a part-time post and certainly not a full-time post, so in her regular day job, she is an attorney at law and holds the chair as professor at law at the University of the West Indies here at the Faculty of Law KFO campus. She has a doctorate from Oxford University, LLM from Cambridge University, and an LLB from the University of the West Indies. In addition to lecturing at Cave Hill, she has also lectured abroad, including the United States of America. Commissioner Antoine has substantial international consultancy experience. She has served as senior legal advisor to virtually all the governments of the Commonwealth Caribbean and also to governments outside the Caribbean, and also to several international and regional organizations. In addition to all that, she is an award-winning author who has written eight books and numerous reports and articles and drafted several laws. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite Ms. Professor or Commissioner Rosemary Balantwine to give the keynote address. Good evening, everyone. And of course, I want to add my words of welcome to all of you, especially our guests. I don't know if I can call you guests from the Commission, <laughs> and our um, guests who are going to be at a very important meeting we're holding tomorrow from across the region, the region of the Americas. We'll be talking about sexual orientation in relation to employment, and I see also a director from the OAS. I'm sure there are other distinguished uh, guests in the audience, but um, welcome to all of you, including my students. And as was mentioned, I stand here in a dual capacity, not just my citizenship, but I am also, I am both a commissioner and a very proud member of the faculty, so it's a double pleasure for me. And my task is really to frame the discussion, since what we're really looking forward to is a, a diverse and vibrant panel and audience participation. And I like Mr. Kamabash, I am really happy that we can have this discussion at the Faculty of Law, because I do agree that although we've had a lot of dialogue in the media and the talk shows and so on, we do need an intellectual space that is objective and dispassionate to discuss these issues together with public engagement. So it's very important for me that we are hosting here, and I want to congratulate ourselves uh, for hosting it and I think it also demonstrates on behalf of the Commission that we don't just sit in Washington and make decisions for everyone else but that we as a Commission we are willing and we are indeed eager to bring these issues to the people of the region so it's not an all, at all an insular approach and as a, a Human Rights Commission we continually hear matters of profound significance to the lives of, of ordinary people. As we sit here, for example, we, we are looking at cases for Haitians who are born in the Dominican Republic and who have been denied citizenship in that country and are now stateless. So these are the kinds of issues, but I think there's perhaps no more important issue than the subject of an individual's personhood, their very identity, not just their sexual identity, but the very sense of being. And I don't think you can divorce sexual identity from self. And it is in that context that I think this is an extremely important issue, this issue of discrimination, human rights, as it relates to sexual orientation. And by some strange coincidence, I heard on the news this morning that today is coming out day. I didn't know that. That's a coincidence, a day where um, persons who you know, can celebrate their, their sexual orientation. The Commission has determined that this subject is one of seriousness and urgency. We have included it in our strategic plan since 2011 
and we have gone as far as creating a special unit to deal with these issues to ensure that the thematic emphasis is not lost. Said it by one Victor Madrigal, and we have here with us also persons of support, Fanny Gomez and Mario Gomez um, from Washington. And we will continue to hold hearings on the issue. We've been holding special hearings, hearing petitions, and we have a role in, in providing an educational input to ensure that there's visibility to this issue. And I think visibility in particular for persons in the transgender community very often lost in the discussion. So we are already determined to fully air the issue and to provide support for a policy framework that I think will be fully consonant with human rights. And I have said before, I said it in Trinidad recently, that for me human rights is an evolving force. It has to be centered, it has to be cemented in the lives of people. So that we must, the people must be allowed to participate in the dialogue. It's not a monologue. So it requires full engagement of the society. It's not something that we simply inherit human rights values, in my view, whether it is from our former colonial masters or that values that are just imposed upon us. We have to engage in it. We have to contribute to the dialogue. So I think that we have to be part of an evolving human rights culture. And for me, what this means is that we have to challenge ourselves. We have to open up ourselves to reflection and examination. And perhaps there's no other topic than this topic of sexual orientation that is so ripe for debate and for self-examination. I'm always amused when I hear persons on the talk shows and so on saying that they don't want those foreign ideas coming to our shores. You know, there's other people trying to bring, not about us, our values, and Mr. Kamabach spoke about some of them. But at, when we're talking about the law, at very least, the legal principles that surround this debate are very much foreign, the principles that we have inherited. They were not, and they're still not, an expression of our own intent to shape our law, according to our norms and our societies. Sodomy laws, for example, the very infamous sodomy laws which prohibit the act, those were not products of our own desires. We didn't write those laws. We didn't participate in the engagement in those laws. They were not a product of some deep reflection about the nature of our societies or the direction of our societies. And still less saving law clauses. And those are the clauses in our constitution that preserve laws like sodomy laws. Those laws, these saving law clauses, which seek to entrench these kinds of laws in our constitutions. They represent even less a desire on our part to really, hope, to really develop law and a legal system. It really was the opposite. They represent a desire to hold on to something that was foreign. So let's preserve what was there before because we were afraid to move on. And that is what frames the debate today about sexual orientation. So it, there's an irony in there somewhere for me. But even as I think we have to move forward towards a better understanding of this issue and engage in debate and so on, I do think that there are some inescapable truths that we have to confront. And the first is that without exception, international law holds us to a commitment to pr provide protection against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And I think that can now be viewed as a universal standard. So while the content of that discrimination can still or still needs to be measured, we're not quite sure about the parameters of that, we can quibble over what constitutes discrimination, what doesn't constitute discrimination in this context. Does it mean same-sex marriage, for instance? But that discussion does not take away 
from the universal principle of non-discrimination. And the other fundamental principle is that human rights proclamations across the board, internationally, and all the prote protective provisions that we have, even those in our own constitutions, are issued in the language of personhood. And that is not a concept overlaid by considerations of identity. So we don't talk about person's identity, we talk about their personhood. So for example, whether we look at the American Convention, whether we look at the American Declaration, it talks about every person being given rights. Article 24 of our convention, the American Convention, talks about all persons being equal before the law. So for me, there's no concept of, what a, of, of an identity which is artificially constructed, whether it, and constructed by society, of course, to distinguish between persons in the sense of making them apart from. Yes? So rights that are secured to persons are not to be differentiated by reason of race, for example, religion, class, and also not sexual identity. So I think this is a fundamental error that those who speak only of morality as limiting as opposed to liberating make. And I reject this notion. I think the essence is personhood. So whether we are talking about civil rights or whether we are talking about economic rights, social rights, such as your right to work, your right to be educated, your right to have a house, to get a pension, health care, all of these are to be regardless of your sexual orientation. So to the extent that our constitutions fall short of these standards, and the only reason that they can fall short is because of these savings law causes, which I said were historical accidents, we have to move towards an initiative which would bring us to constitutional amendment and reform, if that is what it's going to take. And what is the real context of this problem of sexual identity? What are we actually condoning? I don't think it's simply a moral issue. It's not simply a religious issue to present it in a nice theoretical package. Because this is an issue that confronts concrete examples of life and death in this region. I'm not talking about anywhere else. I'm talking about here in the Caribbean. It addresses some of the most horrific forms of violence known to our supposedly peace-loving nations. No problem, nothing is a problem, warm, friendly, etc. But when we look at the examples of violence against persons because of their sexual orientation, we condone violence that we will never tolerate, I think, even against the worst drug baron or the worst murderer in our society. And the commission has heard and continues to hear reports, uh, reports that are corroborated about some of these kinds of violence. And several NGOs, you'd hear from them, them later on, I'm sure, these examples. In Jamaica, yes, but not only in Jamaica. Surprisingly, it's better documented in Jamaica, Barbados too, Trinidad. And so with one incident, 15 to 20 men attacked four men in one house. Yes? And I asked, what does this say about our own humanity, about our own morality? So there are those, I'm sure, the writers among us who might say, well, we have not ever condoned violence. Not me, like the Pharisees. But I think that assumption of innocence ignores the reality that often violence in a society is rarely born out of these skewed perceptions, misconceptions, misunderstandings, which rarely flow from our own words. Because they create value systems, they create fear. Words have power. They can incite violence. We saw it in Hitler's Germany. We saw it in Rwanda. We even saw it in Trayvon Martin not too long ago. 
So when we so totally condemn homosexual men or women or transgenders, the case may be, for daring to exist in their skin, when we objectify such persons as being evil or damaging to society, I don't know what message we send. Why, do we, why are we surprised when there's violence afterwards? And I don't want to get into the religious debate, um, but it does seem to me to be very far from the central message of peace and love and understanding that I see when I read my Bible. So I think that we have to accept responsibility for violence against persons. Who in law is our neighbor? See some of my students here. What does that mean? And that also includes harassment. And what is more disturbing is that there are several, le several levels of discrimination, both indirect or direct, de jure, de facto, which often reinforce some of the worst forms of prejudice in our society. So for example, we, there have been links made between homophobia and poverty a class paradigm, in other words. And that goes into issues of race again, HIV, even gender. The late Robert Carr, one of our renowned sociologists in the region, he documented some of these experiences, Jamaican community, gay Jamaican communities, and he identified a pattern of a predominance of violence against working class gay men. And he saw law and legal authorities as actually condoning this. We can also look at how HIV interacts with this issue of sexual orientation. I think we know that uh, because of vulnerability, because of discrimination due to stereotypes, that the impact is disproportionate on persons who have different sexual orientation. We know too from our hearings at the Commission, from the petitions, from the reports, about another subset of discrimination, and that is that LGBT community feel, feels compelled to go underground, to hide, because, and that prevents them from accessing health care, for instance, which undermines our health, public health efforts. They are afraid of accessing the justice system, even when they are victims of crime, don't want to come forward, profound social marginalization and vulnerability, so forced into hiding. And we have reports even from Trinidad and Tobago about issues like that, even where NGOs have offered peer counseling and so on. Persons are afraid to even accept because of, quote, uh, they, they are afraid that they will, they will be re-victimized, unquote. So in other words, a, a complete breakdown of the social support system because of fear. And in the employment context, of course, we understand that opportunities are lessened because of prejudice. And this is exacerbated because of the perception that, you know, if you're gay, you have HIV, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a disturbing reality. And we appreciate, or perhaps we don't always appreciate, that the legal restrictions which actually exist relate prime only to the act of intercourse, or in Guyana it also relates to cross-dressing, but it does not really relate to a person's actual status or being. And this really should not have a bearing on your ability to maneuver in the system, whether it's to get work and so on. But what has happened in our region is that we have, because there's a sodomy offense, we have, and it's criminalized, we have allowed it to filter through everything in terms of sexual orientation. And I think there's a distinction to be made between the offense of sodomy and the attitude of the law towards sexual identity. The two things have become entwined. This was something that, we, that the court in Surat didn't understand, for example, when they were considering whether sexual orientation um, should be protected or not. And so there's really, under our law, no authority to discriminate against a person on the basis of their sexual identity or orientation. The law really can only prosecute the act of sodomy, which is bad enough, but I think it is still an important distinction. And this misconception really about the law permits this continuing acquiescence. It provides a safe haven for discrimination. And so, uh, as we move on, 
we have to consider this distinction and how we go about not just seeking decriminalization which has taken with the issue but ensuring that we accept that the values we have are broad enough and should be broad enough to be proactive. Unfortunately, we have had very few cases in the region. One of the more enlightened ones is Delgado case in Belize. I presume that you know that we have a very important case happening right now in Belize as well. Um, just this morning I got an email from my colleague Westman who is involved in the case and the courts have just struck out UNIBAM, which is the NGO, on the basis that they had no standing to bring a challenge to the sodomy laws in Belize because the court said that the UNIBAM is not a person, it's an organization. So a technical point, and rather interesting that they accepted the Catholic Church as a party, the Catholic Church had, had standing, and the court talked about the law being based on morality. All laws, including the Constitution, must be based on morality. And in the view of the court, and my law and legal system students must be loving this, um, morality in the eyes of the court is defined as emanating from religion. That's hot off the press class. And preserving public order. Of course, it raises the question, well, whose morality? Does it have to be based on religion? Or what happens to Trinidad, where we have so many different religions? I don't know what we'll do there, but that's the latest on that case. And I think the age-old question about law and morality, I think law is probably best suited to take account of morality when it professes to give rights as opposed to taking away rights. That's how I prefer to look at it. But from a pragmatic approach, um, I also think, particularly in relation to the employment sphere, that having these discriminatory practices, because they're not always law, as I explained, and excluding persons because of their sexual orientation, also results in a large proportion of the society being marginalized and also being unproductive, say in the employment sphere. And we have heard accounts of persons who are afraid to work or cannot work, etc., and claim that the only work they can get is sex work, so they end up as sex workers, which seems to me rather odd. There seems to be a high demand of sex work for a society that professes to disapprove of homosexuality, but nevertheless. So if we are truly interested in development, are we really willing to condemn a high percentage of productive workers' oblivion. And that's a pragmatic approach I'm throwing out here. It was the same issue that we had to face when we talked about gender and women and the workplace. And if we are to believe the statistics, and it was probably a controversial statistic a few years ago when the chief medical officer, Carol Jacobs, claimed that we have over 60%, correct me if I'm wrong, of um, men in Barbados being either bisexual or gay, homosexual. That was not, those are not my statistics. So that's a high percentage of persons that we are marginalizing. And the final point I want to make is one that I can take from my, my colleague Tracy who expressed this concern to me more than once actually. Um, the views of lesbians in the LBGT community that they feel that they are being left out in the movement, that most of the attention is on gay men. I thought that was an interesting point, which I hope we can discuss today. I, I wondered if it is simply that men or males, male homosexuals, threaten the status quo more, as opposed to women, this male construct of power, because of course the patriarchal society, heterosexual and so on, is that a spin-off of that? And, or it could also be just simply a question of bias in the community, as I said, that's something that you will discuss, but certainly reinforcing some of those levels of discrimination that people face. It is probably true that for a long time, lesbians were seen as, okay, that's all right, we can tolerate that, it's titillating, except where lesbians are powerful in terms of their careers, and then they become a problem. So I think that's an interesting dynamic that has been reported to me that I would throw out. But just to leave you on that note, that we have also noted an increase 
and violence recently in terms of lesbians. Maybe that says something about changing power relations. So those are my few thoughts to start the dialogue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Professor. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Antoine. Uh, we, at this stage, will now move from the podium to the head table, and we begin our, our panel discussion, which is a slightly more informal aspect of, of the, this afternoon's discussion. And, um, the, one of the significant points that Professor Antoine made was the fact that we, we need to have a dialogue. We need to have a dialogue as a community and certainly the dialogue can begin here and this is a, perhaps a better, uh, more comfortable space within which to have that dialogue and the dialogue requires on the one hand the, the academic and intellectual weight of Professor Antoine and persons such as her but also requires the input of one could say practitioners or persons who actually feel the weight of discrimination of the LGBT community and it is for that reason that we have some balance in tonight's uh, panel. So the first LGBT representative would be uh, a board member of CAISO, which is a non-governmental organization based in Trinidad and Tobago that is dedicated to making sexual and gender diversity part of Trinidad and Tobago's national identity by actively challenging the government on issues of gender policy and sexual orientation. Her current projects include the uh, documentary, which, which actually uh, demonstrates discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as analyzing facts and patterns in cases of discrimination in areas of employment, education, the provision of food and services in Trinidad and Tobago. She also works with the Death Penalty Project in the United Kingdom, London and United Kingdom. So ladies and gentlemen, we now hear from Ms. Tamara Sylvester, who will give us her perspective on the LGBT challenge from the perspective of CAISO in Trinidad and Tobago. Hi, good evening, ladies, gentlemen, distinguished guests, lovers, and other strangers among us, and those of you, of course, viewing us over the web. Uh, I'm Tamara, it's delightful to be here, and I would like to thank Professor Antoine in particular because she's touched on a lot of the things I was going to present on. <laughs> So we can skip right along and get to the juicier part, which is really the work with Tell Your Story, which is the documentation aspect of Kaiso's work. But just to give you a little background, Kaiso is focused on the Equal Opportunity Act. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. I'm sure the law students would be, considering that you all have to um, pretty much know all the laws all over the Caribbean, which is unfortunate. I'm glad I studied in England. <laughs> um, so. We chose to focus on the Equal Opportunity Act rather than the buggery laws because we thought that there would, have more practic there would be more practical impact, right? Uh, the buggery laws, yes, they're there on the books, yes, they increase stigmatization and they help to perpetuate this idea that homosexuality, lesbianism, all of the above are unacceptable in our society. However, they are not actively enforced at least directly. So we thought by getting the government to make amendments to include sexual orientation due to the explicit exclusion under Section 3 that this would have some immediate and beneficial impact to persons in our society. Right, so this is just a bit of a background of Trinidad's laws that draw off of the, off of the buggery laws. And it reveals, when you look at the laws and you read the definitions and the references in there, it reveals that law only recognizes persons who engage in partnerships with persons of the opposite sex. Right? And Surat, the judgment that was, um, was Surat versus the Attorney, Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago that Professor Antoine talked about highlighted the issues, the unconstitutionality issues with this act. Firstly, and I want to talk about the, the long title, because it's quite funny, the long title starts off saying, this is an act to prohibit certain kinds of discrimination. I'm not sure what the point of an act that is supposed to prohibit discriminatory 
behaviors and actions of, of starting off with saying only certain kinds of things are allowed or are protected. So from the get-go, this act was going to be problematic. It's clear, right? And Ivor Archie points out in, her, in the Court of Appeal judgment, Right. So he talks about the effect of specifically, specifically excluding the, a particular category of persons on the ground of sexual orientation from protection afforded by the EOA to others is to deny them a fundamental right on the basis analogous to one of the grounds enumerated under Section 4 of the Constitution. It is a denial of protection of the law and of equality of treatment under the law. So we have this explicit exclusion of sexual orientation and we also have an inadvertent or indirect exclusion of gender identity because there's a conflation. Section 7 talks about gender as if it were synonymous with section 3, uh, uh, sorry, with, sec with sex in the act, right? And what does Chief Justice Archie say about this? He says, the, EO, the EOA is an unusual and contradictory statute since it appears to regard sex and gender as having an identical meaning that is different from sexual orientation and sexual preference. The fact that by, defini by the definition of sex in Section 3 specifically excludes from its protection persons who claim discrimination on the basis of sexual preference or orientation while at the same time purporting in Section 7 to prescribe certain acts motivated on the basis of gender. He goes on to say that the current, current usage of both of these expressions, as revealed by the dictionary, an examination of reputable dictionaries, he says, is that while the, word, while the word sex is generally understood to refer to biological division of species between male and female in respect of reproductive roles, the concept of gender is broader and is more of a social, cultural, and even psychological construct. Gender, although it is nowhere defined in the EOA, can include sexual orientation. Thus, as I said, we have an ex inadvertent denial of rights to persons, well, denial of protection against discrimination on the basis of gender identity, as well as sexual orientation. So the Court of Appeal ruled this act unconstitutional on the basis of Section 3 as well as on the basis of other sections that were, that were posited as being unconstitutional. However, it went to the Privy Council and unlike Barbados, Trinidad has not jumped on the CCJ bandwagon as yet. And unfortunately, we end up with this bad precedent as a result of that unfortunate Anyway, I'm not going to go down that road. Anyway, so we, end, so we get this Privy Council judgment saying, sorry, but we don't think that it's unconstitutional, but we're not really going to look at Section 3 and the issue of sexual orientation and the exclusion therein. We don't need to do that to rule that this act is constitutional. So here we are. What does that mean for Trinidad and Tobago? It means, in addition to all the past acts, the domestic violence, the cohabitational acts, the buggery laws, and recently the Children's Act, and the Statutory Authorities Act, all of which exclude sexual orientation, it means that we have this unequivocal, blatant, flagrant statement that it's okay to discriminate against people on the basis of sexual orientation. And if one thinks a little harder about it, on the basis of gender identity as well. That doesn't mean that people haven't noticed, but it tends to be people who are more educated than those who are less educated. And unfortunately, our country, while it is considered by the UN to be somewhat de more developed and not as developed as a developing country, and somewhere in between, we have a lot of issues in providing good education to the majority of the country. 
Not only that, the majority of the country belongs to religions, and I know that Brown and, Professor Brown and Twine met, asked the question, sorry, Bell and, Bell and, and Twine. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes. She, she, she asked the question, what happens in a country like Trinidad with so many different religions? But really and truly, if you go to the, the um, if you look at the consensus, the, the census statistics, the 78.1% of Trinidadians, while they don't belong to the same religion, they all belong to religions that condemn homosexuality. So in essence, we still have this religious indoctrination of homophobia at play in our society. And this obviously inform the laws, the laws in turn entrench these ideas again. So we get this vicious cycle going on here. We're never going to escape this unless somebody comes and implants and injects some kind of logic. And how are we going to get that logic when the majority of the persons in the country can't afford an, a, a tertiary education or get a good secondary, secondary education that allows them or affords them this opportunity to learn how to think, right? It's about learning how to think. And I wanted to read you uh, uh, um, an article I had from a person who wrote to the Express, right? It's an editorial that shows you how the, the inability to, to, to think outside what you know and what you've been told and to really take, take the things or the things that you take as truth a step further leads to this illogical, irrational justification for being homophobic, right? The, the, um, the editorial says, why should we legalize a problem? How, on how many issues are we going to blur the lines of what is right and what is wrong to accommodate, to accommodate those who stand on the wrong side of the line? We continue to look for reasons to justify abortion, homosexuality, prostitution, and countless other ills. Some talk of choice for women with unwanted pregnancies, but women have a choice, the choice of contraceptives and abstinence. I'll let you all run with that one for yourselves to see how this person clearly fails to recognize all the other issues at play when a woman makes a choice whether to have sex or not to have sex, right? Victims of rape and incest cannot erase the past by making an innocent unborn child a victim of, ex of execution. Um, let me skip a little bit because this is the really logical part. If homosexuality was a healthy alternative way of life, then homosexuals would be able to populate an island of their own and lead meaningful lives without interference. So we need to also get an island for barren women and for women who choose that they don't want to have kids. So it goes, you know, I mean, it's clear here that this person is not thinking, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway. So... <laughs> Professor, Professor Kenneth Ramchand, an educated man, and he, during one of the heated, highly contentious debates on the constitutionality of the Equal Opportunity Act, stated the bottom line. The bottom line is homosexuals and lesbians and all of the above are human beings, right? And the bottom line is that the bill discriminates against them. And he says, on that basis, it's unconstitutional, right? But what do we have other legal, and this is where I get a little bit frightened, because we also have educated individuals who are educated in law, for example, like uh, Mr. Anand Ram Logan. He, he is now the Attorney General, and he actually stated that the Equal Opportunity Act does not discriminate, because homosexuality is a breach of divine law. So he apparently is working on, uh, he, 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 the context within which he is drawing this conclusion is some, a country with this theologically infused democracy. You know, I, I, I'm not sure where the divine law comes into the picture, um, but I am sure that Anna knows <laughs> that democracy and theocracy are two different things altogether, and I'm sure he also learned that 
our democracy has nothing to do with the laws of the Bible, especially living in a country that has how many different religions, right? Um, what else was said? Then there was the Reverend Tilak Singh. Well, he's a reverend, so one would expect. But he stated, and it's the way he stated it, he said, the government is not yet ready to give approval to homosexuality. Any, anybody, anybody want to run with that one? We mean not give approval to homosexuality, <laughs> right? But fortunately, there were a few independent senators who stood up and spoke out, and Mahabir Wyatt pointed out that you cannot be advancing this homosexual act being criminalized as a justification because there's a distinction between a behavior and a preference. You cannot discriminate against someone because they have a preference. They haven't done anything wrong, right? However, these objections fell on deaf ears and the act was still passed and imp well, implemented in 2007. And it remains on the books today as is. And recently again it came up in 2011 and this time the Equal Opportunity Commission advanced two justifications. Again it relied on the, on the fact that it was illegal and then they also said, but wait a minute, we don't have any instances of discrimination. Right? So clearly we don't need to protect against it. And this is how Tell Your Story TNT came about. Because we figured age got passed, age, age was um, proffered to Parliament to be included as it was excluded basis, on the basis that I think it was about three or five, five complaints were made to the Commission. So we said, okay, well, we could get six, and then they would say, okay, there's a basis, right? But what is the problem? What is the problem? The problem is nobody's out. <laughs> nobody's out. Nobody's there testing anybody to see whether or not they will actually get discriminated against, right? We have laws that feed, that increase the stigmatization and homophobic attitudes and therefore people hide. They live mm -hmm. underground. They suppress who they are, right? And they refuse to come out of the closet. And by all means, if, if they get caught, they kill themselves. Now, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> okay. I will then go to but there are and there are few there are few persons who, who come forward and talk about it. And we actually have met with about ten individuals so far who have given us accounts of discrimination that have experienced in the workplace. Right? Dion. Dion is a transgendered woman and I'm not going to tell you where she works, but Dion has experienced no end of problems at her job based on the fact that she is a man and dresses like a woman. And when I say dresses like a woman, I'm going to say that very loosely because in actuality, Dion dresses like a man really because there's this overlap between how a man and a woman would dress in a, in a workplace. Right? I can go to work like this, for example. And a man can go to work similarly, similarly attired. So she meets the standards of professionalism. So really and truly what the problem is, is with her, comp with her appearance. She appears, quote unquote, in a, uh, um, in cons she does not comport herself in a manner that is consistent with societal expectations for a man. Right? So that's the basis upon which her employer has called her into his office and read her passages from the Bible, told her that she's going to burn in hell, she has been um, forced to use the male washroom even though she did in fact find a neutral washroom. She found a, a neutral washroom and the, the, there's a parking attendant washroom. There's no, door, there's no sign on the door, male or female, and there's no urinal in the washroom. So one can assume that this is a neutral unisex washroom. 
and the parking attendant can be either male or female. There's no requirement that a parking attendant be male or female. So we have this neutral space that she was using that she was told not to use anymore because the parking attendant who happened to be male was not comfortable with it. What he wasn't comfortable with was the fact that Dion was a man looking like a woman. Right? So Dion has reached the point, I think, where enough is enough. And we are currently looking at strategies, and this is where I would like feedback, especially from students and so on, because you're at a very creative stage, right, on how we could possibly, given the fact that we don't have any policies, how we don't have any laws, get around this issue with Dion. What we've looked at is some American cases, basically, that say that sexual, um, imposition of sexual stereotypes um, on males or females uh, will fall under sex discrimination. So we can come and argue for Dion under the EOA, on the sex, on the, on the basis that she doesn't conform to the gender stereotype for her legally registered sex, which is male, right? But I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to give me some other ideas so that we can help Dion overcome what's going on or at least get, get some kind of recourse, legal or otherwise, um, for what she's experiencing at her workplace. Uh, here ends my uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tamara, from the organization Kaiso, a uh, very uniquely titled organization. Um, those of you who would have seen the flyer advertising tonight would have noticed the name Patsy Granham, who um, unfortunately could not join us. And the person I'm about to introduce now, for the record, is not Patsy Granham. Let's be thought <laughs> otherwise. Um, Patsy had some challenges today with work, and as a result, um, uh, the organization is being represented by another individual. Uh, this gentleman has been in the HIV AIDS fight since 1998. He was part of an NGO formed in New York called Caribbean Pride in 1998. After returning to Barbados, he joined Ucalab, which is United Gays and Lesbians Against AIDS in Barbados, in 2001. He has been the project coordinator for accelerating the private sector response to HIV AIDS within the tourism sector. And through Aid Inc., was funded, uh, which was funded by DFID from 2008-2009, uh, they were partnered with other NGOs and government to make the project a success. Yuglad is the oldest and most respected LGBT organization in Barbados and as such uh, Mr. DeCourcy Hudson who will now speak to you for a few minutes has a unique perspective to share. Mr. DeCourcy Hudson. Thank you. Good evening to one and all. Um, Section 23 of the Barbados Constitution provides that no law shall near any provision that is discriminatory either of itself or in itself or in its effect and that no person shall be treated in a discriminatory manner by any person by virtue of any written law or in performance of the functions of any public office or any public authority. Despite such a resounding pro proclamation against discrimination LGBTI individuals in Barbados face an ongoing battle for basic human rights which are denied on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity. The, cent the central most erroneous violation of LGBTI rights in Barbados is the state's criminalization of same se sexual activity. The buggery laws as they are known typically apply in arbitrary fashion only to homosexuals reflecting a wider cultural consensus regarding the immorality of non-heterosexual human relationships. The discriminatory state sanctioned provision serves as the foresee around with other substantive violations of the ICCPR occur in Barbados. Such violations include the arbitrary detention and imprisonment of LGBTI persons degrading treatment and punishment, the de privation of liberty and conspicuous withholding of benefits to be factor same-sex couples. Despite numerous instances of discrimination against LGBTI persons in Barbados, 
such as those chronicle in this report and the fact that the ICCPR clearly prohibits such conduct the government of Barbados did not see fit to permit the need to protect LGBTI rights amongst its priorities in its most recent periodic report to the Human Rights Committee despite such lack of attention Barbados continues to have an obligation under the ICCPR to guarantee fundamental human rights to all persons including LGBTI individuals. Government's commitment to treat all individuals in the public sector in a fair, fair and non-discriminatory manner regardless of the HIV status or any life-threatening illnesses. The policy seeks to promote the development of a supportive ethical and human rights were environment that protects the fundamental rights and freedoms of persons living with HIV and other LTI. In addition, it provides guidelines for the public sector in the effective management of these issues to ensure a consistent approach in dealing with public sector employees living with HIV and other LTIs. The committee was formed in 2001 by the Labour Ministry as a response to challenges posed by HIV AIDS in the workplace. It comprises key stakeholders including the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of the Civil Service, the Barbados Christian Council, the Council of Trade Unions and Staff Associations, the Barbados Employers Confederation and the National AIDS Commission and Care Barbados. According to the findings of our research, there was no easily identified person identifiable person in the organization that would deal with a workplace problem regarding HIV or any other health issue. According to the civil service, there were a number of different people dealing with these issues including personnel officers or senior clerks, the project coordinator disclosed. Ms. Boucher added that managers and supervisors will have a critical role to play in ensuring adequate mechanisms were put in place to deal with such matters in the workplace and to ensure the code was implemented in the most efficient manner possible. Ms. Boucher also pointed out that one of the goals of the Labour Ministries program and by extension the code of practice is to develop a supporting, safe and healthy environment where the rights of persons are respected. The issues of stigma, discrimination and confidentiality are major issues which are addressed in the code of conduct, the code of practice. These are critical in the process of ensuring that persons feel comfortable and that, that they can come to work and not be ostracized or gossip about and whatever information they bring to the workplace will be protected, she observed. Ms. Boucher stressed that the code of practice will not be implemented in a vacuum, but pertinent legislation on stigma and discrimination is being discussed to but rest the document. In this regard, she revealed the Attorney General's office was in the process of looking at omnibus legislation on anti-discrimination to address persons living with HIV and AIDS. However, while this process is at initial stages, the party unit has revealed there were still avenues for recourse if employees felt that they were being targeted or treated unfairly due to their perceived or actual status. While there is no legislation at the moment that would support the code, the Minor Offenses Act can be used to protect workers from harassment and the Public Service Act speaks to the issue of confidentiality, Ms. Boucher pointed out. Chapter 154, 9 of the Laws of Barbados defines the sexual offense of buggery and provides for a punishment. A person who commits buggery is guilty of an offense and is liable of conviction of in indictment to imprisonment, to imprisonment for life. Barbados criminalization of sodomy has the effect of anonymity to per se discrimination against homosexuals as is discussed below. Similarly, 11 to 12 of the laws of Barbados which define and prescribe the crimes of indecent assault and seriously indecency are troublesome because of the vague definition of serious indecency as an act whether natural or unnatural by a person involving the use of the genital organs for the purpose of arousing or gratification sexual desire. The use of the word unnatural in the definition of the crime perils that state as issue in turn that O Lord intercourse against nature. These laws can be easily engineered to target and prosecute 
homosexuals and more generally all non all non reproductive sexual behavior. The effect of having legal penalties for sodomy and for vaguely defined indecent acts is that even when they are not enforced, these laws strengthen social stigma against homosexuals. That stigma in turn can be even more effective than legal penalties in stripping individuals of the economic, social and political rights guaranteed to them under the ICCPR 5. When a person, when a homosexual person cannot find employment, secure adequate housing or get proper medical treatment because of social stigma, these difficulties amount to the privations of life, liberty, health and opportunity on the basis of sexual orientation. Barbados' law criminalization sodomy reinforces the animus that enables these violations to occur. The U.S. State Department country report for Barbados in 2005 states that although no statistics were available, evidence suggests that societal discrimination against homosexuals occurred. The continuing existence of discrimination against homosexuals reinforces the need for the state to end the, the prohibition against private homosexual behaviors embodied in 9, 11, and 12 of the laws of Barbados. Repealing these provisions will be an affirmative and much needed step in ending discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in Barbados. Notably, the law of criminalization sodomy is also detrimental to Barbados efforts towards HIV education, prevention and care. In Thomas v. Australia, the, Unite, the Human Rights Committee noted that the criminalization of homosexual practices could not be considered a reasonable means or a proportionate measure to achieve the aim of preventing the spread of HIV and AIDS. In fact, as the state party in that case contended, statutes criminalization homosexual activity tend to impede public health programs by driving underground many of the persons at risk of infection. The committee concluded that in terms of that criminalization of homosexual activity thus would appear to run counter to the implementation of effective education programs in respect of HIV and AIDS prevention. Secondly, the committee notes that no links has been shown between the continued criminalization of homosexual activity and the effective control of the spread of the HIV AIDS virus. In September 2006, the Minister of State for the, Min for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Barbados said in a speech given at the 5th Caribbean Chiefs of Mission Conference on HIV and AIDS that HIV and AIDS poses the single greatest threat to the region security. A UN AIDS report similarly finds that AIDS related illnesses are the leading cause of death for people ages 15 to 44 in the Caribbean. While this is a positive study, it also underscores the continuing problem of discrimination against HIV and AIDS infected persons. The 2006 UN AIDS report states that in Barbados, significant at risk groups for HIV include homosexual and bisexual persons as well as sex workers. These groups, the report finds, tend to be mainly inaccessible due to stigma and discrimination stemming from cultural, religious and social taboos and beliefs. Primarily evidence also indicates that the growth of the, age, of the AIDS epidemic is faster within these groups. A positive finding of the report was that the baseline studies to identify prevalence of HIV and AIDS among homosexuals, bisexuals, and sex workers in Barbados are presently underway and being executed by the National HIV AIDS Commission, the Ministry of Health, and other partners within the committee. The Constitution of Barbados itself is one of the strongest sources of support for the repeal of anti sodomy law. The State Party report submitted to the Human Rights Committee by Barbados on July 10, 2006 reports that 23.1 of the Constitution has three basic effects. It makes unconstitutional one, any laws which are ex discriminatory, two, any laws that 
are discriminatory in their effect upon persons, and three, any discriminatory action by the state in the exercise of its administrative, judicial, and excessive functions. NGOs have collected stories of various instances of torture against LGBT persons. One organization, United Gays and Lesbians Against AIDS Barbados, reports that for a long time, gay bashing has been a part of the party culture in Barbados. A documented case of discrimination took place in 2004, where three males were charged and sentenced for shooting at and verbally abusing three transgender cabaret performers because of their sexual identity. During the court case, the presiding judge, Justice Jackie Cornelius, told the accused they cannot go around shooting at persons just because they are of a different sexual persuasion. Barbados will not allow it. However, in a case where a gay man died at the hands of his ex-lover, the case in this instance had only been placed the in this instance had only been placed on a bond to keep the peace for twelve months and every break she was spent six months in jail. He literally stabbed his lover twenty one times the start of the morning. LGBT persons in Barbados are free to worship where they want and there is a religious body that ministers to LGBT persons and performs ceremonies for exchange of rings. However, they do not openly advertise this to the general public. I thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, DeCourcy. Um, we've just been reminded by the organizers that we were told, well, I was told officially, officially that we were finishing at 8.15. We now have to be finished by 8. Or, or maybe we can go to 8.15, right? So we can go to 8.15. Um, naturally, part of this is being uh, broadcast, so we would have to respect the timelines, unfortunately. Um, I'm about to open the floor, but I just wanted to make a couple of very quick points, which should hopefully help to massage your thought process. And the first is that um, I have a, a slight bias towards the political, and I, I notice, with all due respect, Commissioner, that the issue is often hijacked, and an attorney at law uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, Kaiso, that the issue is often hijacked by lawyers uh, when it is, for all intents and purposes, a relatively simple political issue to fix. The challenge here is that the political fix is very elusive because it requires politicians to take action that appears not to be in their best interest. So we have a game of gymnastics that occurs in almost every Caribbean country. Like Commissioner Antoine, I too am a commissioner on the HIV AIDS Commission in Barbados, which was set up by government to deal with this issue of HIV AIDS. Uh, the HIV AIDS Commission has been very progressive in trying to address stigma and discrimination and has been very clear on its op opposition to stigma and discrimination in the workplace. Well, ironically, we represent a government that has taken a position which is clearly discriminatory. So we are constantly in this act of balancing where we, we seem to want to go to heaven but we are not prepared to die. And I think this is a challenge that politicians face and I hope that this is one of the issues that you can address in your questions to the panel. The other point I want to make very quickly refers to public opinion and, and um, my organization did a study in Barbados some years ago in which we looked at attitudes towards homosexuals and we realized that there's some interesting peculiarities that emerge. Uh, Barbadians are not a very homophobic people, however we find that there are direct correlations as far as homophobia is concerned with, with gender. So we find that women are less homophobic than men for whatever reason. We also find that younger people tend to be less homophobic than older people, so there are correlations in relation to age. I don't know if this surprises you. There are correlations in relation to education. So this space at the University of the West Indies will always be less homophobic than spaces outside because persons who are more educated tend to be less homophobic than persons who are less educated. Then there's income levels. Persons who work for more money, normally because persons who work for more money are better educated, um, there's a correlation there as well and we find that homophobia tends to be um, heavier among low income groups. And then finally religion and that's the point that I want to open the floor on. We find that religious people, people who are of a religious persuasion are more inclined to be homophobic than those who are not. So there's that interesting marriage of those two. So with those facts in mind, uh, we now open the floor. Uh, please 
if you want to make an intervention or ask a question, can you look for uh, this lady? Madam oh, sorry, this gentleman. Right up, right up. <coughs> good afternoon. Oh, sorry, good evening. Um, this is actually a question for Professor Bell Antoine. Um, I find it very instructive that you're here now giving this presentation as one of the, the commissioners. And I would like to know what kind of um, uh, interaction you all have had with uh, the CARICOM agencies. The reason why I'm asking this is uh, last year it was brought to the attention of the Caribbean community that there were several agencies um, testing for HIV AIDS before you um, before you completed the process of employment. That's one. But in addition to that, this other issue did not come out. The polygraph for which was given to senior officials, um, senior persons um, who were offered positions within that organization, which is CARICOM Impacts, I might add, um, the line of questioning for the polygraph focused specifically on sexual preferences and so on. It was a three hour long polygraph system, which I'm not sure if many people are aware of, but for most of the senior persons, once you were offered a senior position at CARICOM Impacts, um, you had to, to, you were, to, you were asked to um, participate in this polygraph session, which was Three hour, a three hour long polygraph session and you were, the questions were basically um, geared towards your sexual preferences um, that's it, thank you ok, thanks um, Joel what we will do is we take a series of questions and then we come back to the panel in the interest of time so uh, thank you uh, Joel Chiloy and we, we now have another question Good evening, everyone. Professor Antoine, this question is, is to you. In appreciating the biological nature of sexuality versus the social construct of gender, Michael Foucault identified sexuality as a product of social and historical forces, amongst other things, in an overall assessment of the history of sexuality. Now, in keeping with the phraseology used in your presentation about this misconception by individuals who somehow do not interpret the law in, in the way it should, they should, how much of this misconception can be said to be deeply rooted in the hegemonic masculinity culture of our society? And is there any validity to such a misconception? Or is it a cloak to just perpetuate some deep-seated principles or just reverting back to this, the culture of hegemonic masculinity? I'd like to ask a question, more an economic question, uh, to any of the panelists. Have we um, looked at uh, cities and jurisdictions that uh, prohibit discrimination on a lot of different categories and then looked at their economic performance. Um, I cite the, some of the, uh, the creative class research done by Joe Florida where you looked at cities all over the world that respect diversity on all kinds of categories and then they tend to attract innovative people, creative people, weird people, people who don't fit in and then they can come up with more and more innovations, patents, that kind of thing. In a, in a way that benefits society by creating more wealth for everybody. I'm just wondering, are we leaving money on the table by having these discriminatory laws and finding some excuses not to deal with them? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's have, if we can have one more question and then we go to the panel. Is there anyone else? I think, Reverend, there's a hope that you will, will um, want to ask a question. I'll help translate here, my colleague. 
from Argentina. No, traduce. Bueno, teniendo en cuenta el contexto eh, social, político y la legislación eh, en el Caribe en general, si cree que if we take into context the social political context in the Caribbean in general si cree que, que, que bueno que la, la academia pueda jugar un rol eh, fundamental o importante en el proceso de construcción de, de, de un mundo eh, que, que, que plantee pelear contra las barreras de la discriminación what sort of a role do you see for the academy to work against discrimination And that's for professor. Yeah, yes, that, that's for professor um, from okay. the professor commission. Anton. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see if we can get the responses from Commissioner Antoine first, and then uh, we go to other members of the panel who may want to have an intervention in the first round of questions. Professor, you wanted some more time to make a note. <laughs> You all like to hear me talk, eh? All right. Um, first question. Oh, I am aware of that. Is Joel your name? Uh, my my colleague who just went to, we lost him to Trinidad recently. He's gone there to, le to lecture. Arif Bulkan came to me when that arose for my advice. And it is completely true. And I know that CARICOM has denied it. And not only CARICOM, other organizations also asked for, <laughs> for those tests. And it's, you know, there's a disconnect as an institution pushing, you know, non-discrimination and so on. So, yes, I think you just want an opportunity to air that issue. It wasn't really a question. So you've aired it and it's completely true. Um, Sorry, this would be better. Is it better? I don't know. For your cable. But well, that's okay. It's fine. Okay. All right. Um, the second question. Well, the deep question. Yeah. That deep <laughs> question about masculinity. In the end of my speech, when I was talking about the question that lesbians have raised and also just the whole context of violence why it is why violence i think that speaks to what you're saying this thing about about power and releasing power and the whole construct of a man a, ma a male being in control in society society patriarchal which is why lesbians are saying but we are left out we let out the discussion because lesbians apparently are less threatening yeah, in the whole construct, but a male homosexual, that seems to be a much more threatening. So I think that links to what you're asking there about masculinity and all of these. And I think violence is very much of that. I'm sorry, I've been giving very brief answers because we don't have much time. Um, the other one was about product. Well, was it a question to me? Not really. But I did mention the pragmatic approach. And I, again, I agree with you. That's why I said that if we even forget about the morality and the this and the that, just from a pragmatic approach, if we are marginalizing supposedly 60% of people in Barbados, for instance, who could be productive individuals, what does that say about the society? And um, Peter, I agree it's not simply a legal issue, but I thought yours wasn't really a question. And I don't think that I see it as a simply a legal issue. Um, in fact, um, very much a political issue and which is why in terms of I was talking about our words and the message we give with our words and what we incite and sometimes it's not even so much the law because the law is very narrow sodomy and cross-dressing but, but we are the ones who have constructed this huge discriminatory uh, um, paradigm so I agree with you it's not only a legal construct it's much, much wider but I have to say in defense of several politicians I've met on the HIV circuit, because that's another hat that I wear. They've said many times, ministers of health, and I agree with them, that even when they take the brave step and they say, okay, we're going to go forward and we're going to either um, put laws in place to protect uh, HIV discrimination or even in St. Kitts, the Prime Minister announced that they would decriminalize sodomy and so forth. And you know, two things happen. One, according to the, the, the ministers, 
the NGOs leave them in the cold. And I've said this to the NGOs before. They don't come out and support the politicians, so the politicians remain isolated, and no politician is going to go forward with an issue if they don't perceive the public support. So the public, we have to have the lobbying. In the, so it only happens in these spaces, apparently, and not enough lobbying out there. So you're not going to expect any politician to do it on their own, so I think that's part of it. As to the role of the academy, well, I'd like to think that part of what we are doing here in terms of uh, I'm copping out, copping out here to say that this is part of why we are having this collaboration, but also to tell you a very interesting little anecdote. A few years ago, I'd, I created a course called Discrimination Employment, and do you know where the idea came from? From my students. But they didn't say create that course, but they said we wanted students, we wanted courses that were more socially relevant. That was a few years ago, so I sat down and I thought, okay, which course is that? And I created this course. But, so we do. And in fact, I think we hold the distinction of being the first university that introduced a course at, at university level talking about HIV. We've been discussing this for how many years now. So yes, the academy has a role. And I think in, in, in this, is, this is part of what we're doing here, if I understood your question well. So that's my response. Thank you. You've had a slight changing of the guard here. Um, I wanted to take advantage of my role as chair because we have about 50 minutes more to respond quickly to, to one of the other comments you put on the table about the uh, idea of leaving money on the table. And to suggest to you that I've, I've seen the problem in a slightly different way in that we have what I call a level of sexual maturity versus a, sexu a level of sexual immaturity. In many of the Caribbean islands, there's a level of sexual immaturity which is reflected in laws that uh, criminalize sodomy and also speak to um, uh, sexual behavior which is uh, perverse or, or something of that nature, uh, which is something that we would think should not really be defined. And what is interesting is that in these countries, we have higher levels of uh, HIV AIDS prevalence. Uh, while in the developing world, the levels of HIV AIDS prevalence are lower. So that to me is perhaps an unintended consequence of uh, what I call a level of sexual immaturity. So perhaps that is uh, one of the ways that we are frustrating our human capital uh, because we are, we are maintaining that attitude. So that's something, something else to think about in relation to this issue. The floor is open once more. If there are any other uh, persons who want to make a contribution, uh, we can run until 15 minutes past the hour of 8. We have uh, 10 minutes remaining, so please take this opportunity. Hi, Hi um, I'm Dr. Crawford, um, Head of Institute for Gender and Development Studies, and I'm glad we have this panel because uh, about three years ago, I think Island Roots, um, an organization, a student organization, really collaborated in relation to the law students, had uh, another panel discussion. And to also answer the question about what is being done, certainly in looking at our teaching, our, our pedagogy and even uh, I think in my gender and sexuality class we have a lot of law students who to come in and also interrogate some of the ideas around heteronormativity, patriarchy and so forth. So I think that really and truly in terms of transforming some of the cultural biases in relation to uh, LGBT and trans people is the ideology rooted within our culture, um, certainly inherited from religious patriarchal doctrines. So even, um, I forget your name from Kaiso. Tamara. Tamara. It's, it's really challenging because we have the binary of sex and also gender, right, in terms of the, the dichotomies. So even in trying to work through how can you really kind of um, um, move beyond the binary of, of looking at a, a biological male and seeing something different is really challenging in relation to the social culture and the customs within society and also the law. One of the things I think that maybe um, Dr. Antoine or even um, um, Peter, Peter, 
is um, I know in some of the 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 the, the pieces it was stretch, stretching stressing homosexual activity, but when we look at sodomy, it's any sexual activity related to anal sex. So I need we we need to interrogate the discussion in relation to how heterosexual couples or bodies are not policed the same way. Um, so really and truly we're calling for a demoralization of sexuality linked to procreative sex, linked to big biblical teachings and so forth. So since when we really kind of really, really and truly move beyond the conflation of, of same-sex bodies as exclusive to one sex act, we can really kind of tease through the taboos around sexuality generally within our society that limits um, same-sex people and also heterosexuals who may not conform to uh, dominant notions of sexuality. So that's just my, my, my take on it because even in the Constitution, we're missing some categories. We're missing sex in relation to biological, we're missing sexuality in relation to activity, and we're also missing gender. Good evening, distinguished panelists. Um, I did, I'm a representative from the ILO AIDS, uh, Eric Carlson from Chile. Um, uh, what I've learned a lot recently, we talked about um, uh, a legal perspective, political perspe perspective. We found there are a lot of allies in the workplace, uh, unions, employers, organizations, and a lot of times in our work with HIV, uh, that sort of a dialogue can spill over and, and be very helpful in dealing with issues of LGBT. So it will be interesting to hear uh, beyond the uh, legal approach or political approach, the workplace approach. We've got strong allies. We heard a, a bit from the gentleman here from Barbados about a Ministry of a Labor approach. So it would be interesting to kind of thresh out the, the various allies we have uh, from the HIV movement that could be used to be applied in the uh, movement for LGBT rights. Yeah, this is the last opportunity for anyone. Could we go now to the panel for yeah. closing, closing remarks? Right? Yeah, no, we come back. What? We come back to it. Yeah, I just wanted if anyone else so wanted to make an intervention at this stage. No, that's it. Okay. All right. Well, at this point, we go to go back to the panel and we have closing remarks. And perhaps tomorrow you could lead off with your closing remarks. Uh, Okay, I just wanted to, um, to um, talk a little bit about Dr. Crawford's point, which, which I think hits the nail on the head, and in, in, in not just on the, on the issues that you pointed out, but generally you see in law there's this compartmentalization where the law refuses to look outside itself and to look in other fields and other arenas in order to truly understand and reflect the reality, that it, and the reality of the society that is attempting to regulate and... Um, so you get, you have the, as you were talking about, this dichotomy, male-female. But if we look to science, for example, we know that male and female is just too simplistic for the human being, right? Not only if you even go down to the chromosomal level and you start looking at XX and XY, that is not even the reality. The reality is XXY, XO, and the list goes on. So I'm really glad you brought up that point because really and truly the law needs to start becoming more in touch with the environment within which it is existing and, and religion is important too. I'm not too against religion being there, I'm not against gender issues and sociology issues. Any, I mean in the future even something like artificial intelligence may be relevant when we're looking at laws. So really and truly the point that I want to leave with you all in closing is that the law should not be divorced from everything else in society. It's, we've got to take a more holistic approach to how we're legislating for ourselves and especially with respect to human rights. And I thank you all for listening and coming and uh, hope to see you all afterwards at the wine reception. Thank you. <laughs> Well, well, we're anxious to get to the well, the wine reception. We also <laughs> need to hear first from the Corsi Hat. So, close the remarks, the Corsi. Okay, I want to say thanks for giving me the opportunity to come here and present. And I hope it has thought um, and instilled something in the mind of people that whether you're gay, 
lesbian, transgender. You were born with your human rights. And you are an individual and you can make a difference. That discrimination hurts. No matter across the board, whether you're in the workplace or anyway, stigma and discrimination. If you're not strong, it's not easy. Thank you. Professor? <laughs> I'm just to say that yes to emphasize what I said earlier that it is true that the law we've inherited had imposed is often very alien to us and we have to resist these alien concepts we didn't have a hand in it so we have to shape law I agree with you Tamara my sooners know I'm always drilling this into them uh, also just to say to your answer about your, your creative solution we'll talk about sexual harassment law and we finish at the wine okay. uh, it might be a solution but, uh, but my, uh, just, I, I'm actually optimistic like Peter I observe the younger generation is a lot more open and liberal and values are changing so I am optimistic thank you commissioner uh, I just want at this point to thank uh, or should mention I should say that the Activity tonight's activity is part of a, I think it's a two or three day set of activities that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is having in Barbados. This is the one public session, and we are happy that you were able to join us for this session. We are also happy that the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights on Human Rights took the opportunity to convene a meeting in Barbados to discuss these issues of relevance. And we are also grateful, of course, that the facility was made it was made possible for it to be broadcast on the World Wide Web so that people uh, across the world who are tuned into the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights website were able to see us. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't participate in the discussion, but nonetheless, you were able to see what the views and opinions were from this part of the world, because this is an important part of the process. So thank you, fellow panelists, for being part of it. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jeff, Jeff Cumberbatch, for facilitating uh, via the Faculty of Law and hosting us here. Uh, professor, thank you for being the keynote speaker, uh, and thanks also to the Corsi and to Tamara from Kaiso and uh, Yukulad, respectively. And thank you for coming. Thank you.